hopefully. I will shout at you if it's not. Oh, that looks <laughs> nice. Can you all see that, yeah? Yeah. Yep. Oh, all right. What you might find is I apologize if I do decide to stand up. Is I find it really hard to do these things sitting down. Um, years of, uh, of, of <coughs> lecturing and performance and all sort of stuff. It's very hard to do it sit down. So I might get excited and stand up. Well, as long as you've got trousers <laughs> on, I guess we don't mind. <laughs> oh, in that case, I'll stay that down. Um, if you have, uh, obviously, we've got questions. Paul, are you monitoring the uh, chat? I'll go on then if, you, if I'm uh, yeah. well, if, you, if you put any questions as we go along, you've got a question, put it in the chat and I'll um, pick them up regularly as we go through and sort of go back to me if that's okay with everyone. All right, that didn't work. Oh, there we go. Right. Okay. I did stand up right away. Look at that. Right. First thing <laughs> I want to say is um, just make a small point here. What I want to do today is I want to go through... Um, a couple of bits and pieces, and I was just saying to Paul, actually, probably, and, and a second thought has just occurred to me about this. What I'm doing today is stolen, uh, borrowed from a, um, a lecture I do at the university for people when they're talking about uh, their advertising and um, uh, marketing production students. Uh, we're doing a module where they, they're learning how to create uh, video and brand artifacts and things like that around a brand or a product or a service. Uh, and in fact, Paul, one group did the chain walk club this year, didn't they? Have that? Yep. So what this presentation is, is actually about is, is how words um, and the way that you present language uh, affects people. And that's why it's about the messaging and that's why it's about refining your marketing. So that, that's what we're talking about. But don't worry, it's not as, as kind of mad and highbrow as that sounds, because it's got, it's got about three practical exercises in it. Um, that normally if we were in a room, we'd probably do them, but you know, I, I want you to take away and have a go because it might help you see your marketing and see how you're talking to people a little bit. It also hasn't been proofread or checked since I edited it down. <laughs> so anything could happen in the middle of this presentation and I apologise in advance if it does, the chances of it not doing it are very small. Okay, so first thing to remember is that language is all the same. The way that people um, see the language that you, the messages that you send to them, happens in a very similar way regardless of how it's sent because what you're doing is you're transmitting a message okay and that message is received sorry there's something in my way um that message is received based on the users sorry the receiver's understanding that's what we're talking about we're talking about how you transmit your message to your clients to your customers whatever in actual fact, though, how you transmit it doesn't matter as much as communicating it well. Um, Paul Church will, uh, sorry, Stephen Church will probably um, um, give me a, a proper going over for this next time I see him. But grammar, spelling, etc., they're great. They're just part of that transmission system. More important that you transmit well um, and clearly rather than worrying too much about that. Uh, and the same is true with video, audio, everything. It's all about the transmission. Um, the better you do that, the better you transmit, which is what we're talking about today, um, the better your process will leave the broadcast point, leave you, leave your marketing. But um, once it's gone, don't forget you've lost control of it. Okay, so what we're trying to do today is control what you say. What you can't do is control the ears that hear what you say. So you have to um, be as clear as possible to start with it. Uh, I hope that makes sense. I'm carrying on. Paul will wave at me if there's any questions going on. Somebody's just gone. What? But what it comes down to is this. You need to broadcast well, say what you mean to say, make sure that that is reaching the people who want to hear it in a way they want to hear it, because it actually doesn't matter what you say, there's nobody listening. Okay? Look at that, 3D effects. I'm a master. Mm -hmm. Okay, a question for you then. I want, I want this to be, I know it's difficult to be interactive on Zoom, but I, I want it to be as interactive as possible. Um, when you go and buy something, do you take the shortest or the most interesting route to the purchase decision? Um, just have a think about that for a second. I'll run through this and I'll give yourself some thought on that. Because both of those are good. Um, they both work. They both result in a sale, which is in the end why we're all in the businesses that we're in. You see, somebody has to buy um, our products. Sorry, let's put the chat on. 
So, Paul, you're saying it depends what it is as to whether you take the shortest or the most interesting route, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, totally. And here's some examples of the, of the difference. Um, the short route means a faster result, and it's quick, and it's often impulse sales as well, isn't it? When, you know, that quick buy, that quick purchase. Um, for instance, you know, the, the probably the biggest example is sweets at a checkout. Um, you know, those sweets are at a checkout for a very good reason, because people at the checkout will impulse buy and make a quick purchase. Uh, and, the, and the supermarkets get a fast result. The more interesting route, though, um, where you take a, a purchase, uh, where, sorry, the route you take to the purchase is down to interest and engagement, that creates brand loyalty. Yeah, and that's really a very different thing. It, it's, it, it's, it's more a familiarity sales or it's an invested buyer. It's somebody who wants to buy. Not because... Not because um, the kids are, you know, mithering them to buy a, a, a Twix for the car, but because they're invested in what it is. And a good example of this, uh, for the second time I've mentioned it today, is Star Trek. Star Trek is one of the most profitable television franchises ever, to such an extent that it's, it's, it's buyers, the people who watch it, buy its products, buy the books, the comic books, the, the films, everything, are so invested in that product that they will buy it regardless of how good or bad the product is. Um, and if you want proof of that, go and watch Star Trek Enterprise. Um, a terrible show, they actually did one episode just about the captain's dog and people bought it. You know? But that, that Star Trek is, is actually a case study for most television things because it, of, of how to build a franchise that's very successful. And of course, it's branched out to just about every area of the media. Okay, so shortest and, and interesting routes on decision purchases. Obviously, this is far more com complex overall, but it's a good starting point to work from. Do you have a bet to see if you can say Star Trek in every Zoom call you're on? Uh, I do it particularly if, uh, if Chris Lambert's on, because of course it winds him up that I don't say Star Wars. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't speak to him yesterday, uh, May the 4th yesterday, of course, Star Wars Day. I would have taken great pleasure in saying live long and prosper every time I spoke to him. But... <laughs> okay. Um, so before we get on to these exercises then, one, just one other quick thing. Who decides your brand, your message, your service message, your, your business message, all that sort of stuff, who decides what that is? Um, for most SMEs, which you know, I think everybody in the room is, here's a really simplistic model of where the message is created and, and who dictates what that message is. Graphics and everything, look. You have the people who own that business, the, the directors, the owners, the soldiers, whoever you are. And they have the business itself. And if you think about that, between those two things, they can primarily control the message. There's other outside influences in some cases, such as, um, for instance, uh, editorial policies by certain platforms, but we can, we can safely discard those. For the minute, we're concentrating on the stuff we can affect. Where the mistake sometimes gets made is people believe it's one or the other, and it's not. Um, if you look at a, a great example of this is James um, and his daily financial briefings, where He's in an industry, the finance industry, which is heavily regulated, he's heavily controlled. But as the owner of that business, he's put his own message on it. He's putting these daily briefings out about the new stuff he was on earlier. Um, I think he did a, a, a webinar earlier today about the new changes. But it's him that's making that message. The business, however, has an influence on the message he can do because he's regulated. So when you're thinking about the message you're sending out, that's where it is. The sweet spot, swap spot is between the business needs the, of your industry and your needs to send that message out. All right, so. Uh, right, what happened there was, you know when I said I got this from an early PowerPoint? Um, that was a slide that was held over from the earlier PowerPoint that I forgot to delete. So rather than, I can't see the screen, I presume everybody is now mocking me mercilessly, Paul. No, no more than usual. No more than usual. Okay, I apologise for that. That was that was a rogue um, uh, uh, screen about the use of simple graphics in advertising, which you don't need to. Ignore that. Carrying on. Sorry. Okay, the first thing then, like I said, I want, I've got some exercise in here, things that might be worth you taking away and just doing based on what we were talking about there. First one. 
is why people listen. Okay. And I want to put this in terms of your brand promise. Uh, I'm just going to sit down again here. Uh, and what your brand promise is, is what your brand should mean to the customer. Okay. It's what your when your customer thinks of your brand and who you are, whether that's a product, a service, or whoever. It's what the promise is going to be for the purchase, and that should feed into your marketing. So, here's an exercise: um, create a whole paragraph selling the brand on what the customer can expect. So, write down what the customer has every right to expect from your brand. So. Uh, Around Shannon, um, you know, you talk. I've seen, and you, you know, on your website, you talk about the wholesomeness of your cooking, the, the effort you put in, also. And don't restrict yourself. Make that paragraph as long as you want, and as use as flowery a language as you like. But write down on that paragraph what your customer can expect of your brand or your product or your service or you know whatever your primary sales area is. When you've done that. The second part to this is a three part. I want you to bring all of that down to a single sentence and start with the promise is. Okay, so Paul, you know, for instance, if we were talking about the business community, you would be saying the promise is that local, you know, the, the businesses who attend will be promoted, supported, engaging with each other, etc. Yeah, yeah. etc. Et et um, yeah. What I'll do is I'll go briefly about myself for 30 seconds oh. or so. Um, this is the third one. That was me, sorry. Okay. Um, <laughs> so down to a single sense, but start with that, with those three words, the promise is, because that fixes what we're talking about. And it, ele it allows you to write that um, in, in the context of your customer and then finally and this is the one that people find the hardest um, what I want you to do next is bring that down to three words or three combination words I'm not going to be cruel enough to say it has to be three words because you might want to use words like um, high concept or a good value and things like or home cooking or you know that sort of thing um, I'm going to pick on you all the way through now Shannon now I've fixed on you that's it <laughs> lucky Shannon. yeah i don't have the imagination to move on now i'm afraid that's <laughs> um and what we're doing with that once you've done it i want you to go back through your customer facing messages your websites your ads your facebook ads your, your leaflets your um you know your designs your logos your emails your email footage your email headers how do you talk to people how do you sign it off and do they all reflect those three words that you wrote down? Because it should do. That's your brand. It's still down to its smallest point, you know? So you should be saying that all the time. Is it, is it worth me sharing what you had me do in uh, uh, my progression to rebranding to where I am now? Uh, yes. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. I can't remember what that says, was. Yeah, I was going to say, he says yes, he's got no idea what I'm going to no say. No idea what he did, yeah. So, uh, building on what Kevin's talking about now, he asked me for three words that, that I thought best described uh, connect networking as was. And uh, what I did is I cheated a little bit and I went out to about sort of six to eight people and asked them. Uh, I'd written down my, my three words, but I thought it might be quite interesting to see what your customers think. Uh, so, if you are struggling on that, which is the reason I'm sharing it, it might be worth just sort of picking a few, uh, uh, you know, f friendlier customers, you know, engaged in what you're doing and just sort of saying, you know, what three words would you use to, to describe my business? Because it was, and luckily for me, there was, there was common threads through the words that were coming back. There was nothing that was that diverse, but also it was useful to get a customer's perception of it versus, versus my own. Yeah, and of course, you, it, it, it's, a good, um, it's a good exercise to actually go out to ask your customers, not necessarily right now, but at some point anyway, to make sure that they're giving you back the message you're sending out. Because if they come back with, with completely different words than you were expecting, then that should be really setting up a red flag to make you go and look at how you talk to people. Yeah, and there were, there were, no, there were no swear words in any of the words either. No. You say that, you say none. <laughs> You mean a lot, but <laughs> okay. So I'm going to move on from that. Um, obviously, if you need any more on this, just drop me an email later and we'll catch up on it.
Um, okay. Second exercise, uh, this is a really common one. It, this does come up an awful lot with people, is to check your language use. Are you talking the same way your customers talk? You know, we're herd animals. We run with the herd. We think we, we are, uh, you know, we all work together. We all talk the same. We all talk the same language. And if you're not talking like your customers, then you might have a problem unless, before somebody shouts at me, the next question you ask after that is, and should you be talking the same way as your customers? Now, what I'm thinking here is, if you happen to be um, a, oh, somebody involved in, say, the human resources sector, uh, who has, uh, you know, a, a professional um, uh, aspect to maintain, or if you're a lawyer or a financial person, or you, uh, you're a doctor or you're medical or something like that, there is an expectation of how you need to talk. Don't drop it. If, if, if people expect you to behave in a certain way and, and talk in a certain way, then it's really important you actually do that. Yeah? Because, um, you know, like I said, we are, we are herd animals and we have expectations. And human, the human mind, it's a couple of people who do uh, uh, sort of, you know, in, in this area or nothing, but we work on patterns. And we need the pattern. And if the pattern breaks, it, it doesn't do us any good at all. We get upset. Okay, so check your language. Are you talking like your customers unless you have a professional expectation not to? Okay, this one is, 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 is really um, quite fun because you get to look at yourself quite hard here. You ready? And you, you have to be really honest with yourselves when you do this one. Okay. Because it's a keyword exercise and I'm not talking about SEO keywords, I'm not talking about Google, I'm talking about the keywords that you must use or you must avoid in your messaging. So number one then, part one of this exercise, draw up a list of words that factually describe the product or service. Yeah, I don't want you to, don't, don't go outside, don't get into the hyperbole or anything like that, with just facts. So, you know, if you, um, and I come back, go on Shannon then, since you're still on the screen. You know, in your case, Shannon, you'd be writing down now, I make food. Yeah, I, you know, we cook food that is good. Or in fact, not even is good, we cook food is all you do. You're just a list of things. And you can go to the extent of, you know, the little tributaries of that, like, um, you know, we cook food based on local produce, for instance, is, you know, that, that's that's. But just factual, don't do anything with this, make a factual list. Drop a list of undesirable words next. Right? That describe your service. Now here's where you have to be really honest with yourself. If you're in an industry that has a bad reputation, then put them in, put those words in. Um, you know, we, I don't, Paul, if you remember, we did a, a quite a similar exercise to this as well, or I did a similar exercise to this. When I talked to people outside networking, when we did the, the Buscombe rebrand and said, what are network groups? Yeah. And they came back with all sorts of things about high pressure sales and, you know, uh, a cult. One of them said, it's a kind of cult, isn't it? The businesses have like the, uh, like the Masons. That's, you know, what's a network group was my particular favorite. <laughs> but, you know, so be honest here. If, you're, if you talk about the undesirable words that you have, I have a client who, who insisted he, is, um, he works in an area where it does air purification and odour removal, and he insisted on using the word urine. To the points where you could see him hesitate, where he'd go, you know, we were making videos, and he'd say, and of course, it will, uh, it will help get rid of the smell of urine. And I went, you said urine again. <laughs> you know, but these are words that people don't want to hear. They're undesirable words. Just piss poor, isn't it? Uh, I'd suggest you use piss instead. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I didn't. I didn't. We, we didn't we use human smells. Um, part three. This is a fun bit. Now you can go all wild and have fun. Do the fire words. And when I say fire words, I'm talking about words that you can either attach to your uh, words that you've used or, or are individual to your industry, whatever, that are positive and really interesting and really kind of, you know, the big words. 
Charles, you'd be talking about art in there. You'd be saying, you know, capturing moments, memories being made, you know, all that sort of stuff that, that we were talking about recently. You know, that's where the big positive stuff happens. Things that fire people up, you know? Yeah. So get those lists together. When you've got those three lists, you only use list one and list three. Okay? That's all. And never, if you can help it, in any promotional work, um, do anything that doesn't use your fire words. Okay? Always use the fire words. Does that make sense? I'm getting notes from people there. Do you get you see what I'm saying there? Yeah, yeah. I can't hear any snoring. You're doing well, Kevin. All right, that's all good. Although they are all on mute, so I wouldn't know. Yeah, every could be swearing under the breath for all we know. Just like, <laughs> um, and this is one of my favourite quotes here, and this is what why you only use those fire words is because what they cause the facts in in, in number one are saying here's why our product is important. The facts in number two are saying here's why you should care about our product. So you know, window cleaners would put in clean windows. And add, and add the words sparkling clean windows. You know, it's, it's the bit you care about is in those fire words. And that's, that's why they're, they're so important. They go in there the, 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 you know, when you lift the lid off a, off a castle, you just take that the oven and you get that kind of, oh, that's the fire word. Okay. If, if fire words were a color, they would be your favorite color painting bright. You know, it's the orange of Van Gogh sunflowers. They, it's, it's the fire words, the things that, were, that make us love something. And like Seth Golding says there, you know, people say, oh, we're getting pushed on price. Well, either you're too expensive or, you know, practical, list one, or you just don't give them enough to care about. So the price isn't an issue anymore. If you, I, I love Seth Golding. He says such sensible things. Um, a little quote there at the top of this one. This is my top tip for successful communication. Roger Shank is a, uh, as well as a cognitive psychologist, he's a um, AI specialist. He's dealing with um, uh, the, the decision-making, artificial intelligence and various other things. Very clever man. Um, and he, make, he makes the point very, very astutely there that humans really, logic's not our strong point. We don't buy out of logic. We don't buy out of logic. It's, it's, it's kind of a thrown gauntlet to me when, when you hear somebody say, yeah, I've never, never been persuaded by marketing or sales techniques. I, I don't get persuaded. I'm too logical for that. And you think, easiest sell in the world right there. Because that ego, you know, that confidence is immediately gives you a target. All you need to do is make them think they're making a clever decision and away they'll go with their hands in their pocket, you know. Because we're not set up to be logical. We're really not. What we love is stories. We like a good tale. Um, so tell a good story. And when I say that, people say this all the time. Oh, it's a good story. So I'm not talking about um, it, it's a nice color or whatever. I'm talking about overall your whole marketing, making a big story to be told, make it a, make a hero in there. Yeah. Um, sorry, I'm trying to see the chat. You're not missing much. Oh, okay. <laughs> Stephen Church, I say, what's communication? Communication. Um, yes, you can pinch the court, Milo. Yes, of course you can. Uh, Stephen Church, tell him I said to bugger off. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> um, tell him I regret not stealing all these customers now while he was ill. Um, I didn't steal it. I borrowed it, Paul. So make a hero. I was in full flow. Yeah, make, give people a hero to hang on to in your stories when you're marketing, preferably them. Make it a villain. Nobody sells anything without solving a problem. We're all there to solve problems. I'm not even going to go back to one or one on that. You all know that. Everybody understands that. We sell something that solves a problem. You know, and there's an old saying, look for, um, look for the headache that people have and sell the paracetamol. You know, so make a villain. It doesn't matter what it is, but give, give, make it a fight. Make it a story. And what you need to be is the magic sword. Okay? The magic sword. Be the thing that cures their evil, that gets their villain. Slay the monster for them. Give them the thing that lets them slay the monster in your marketing. Don't be Luke Skywalker, be Obi-Wan. Yeah? 
not King Arthur, Merlin. Make them King Arthur. You be Merlin. You be the you be the thing that helps along. Is one way to look at the way you talk to people. Because we love a good story. We do. We're built for it. A lot more on story marketing if you do some work. So okay, we're getting to the end. Promise you, um, we're getting to the end. <sighs> What you need to decide when you come to, to how you tell this story, and I am genuinely not differentiating here between whether you're using a PowerPoint, a video, something written, um, you know, podcasting, whatever you're doing, it doesn't matter. You choose the best vehicle you have to sell that message. You want, you want a message to be told to somebody in the best possible way. Choose the thing that tells it in the best possible way. Don't go into it saying, oh, I've got to write a blog. That's insane. I've got to, you know, I've got to make a video. I'll make a video all week. I've got to make a video. Why? Make it something that is going, is going to transmit that message well. And if you can't, get as close as you can. We're doing something right now that would work a hell of a lot better, frankly. We were all sitting around in a, in a room and we could interact better. I can't see half of you now. But this is the next best option. So go for what there is. Don't beat yourself up about what you can't do. Do what you can the vehicle you use for the journey is actually as important as the message. Okay. Remember that thing I said right at the very beginning, if there's nobody listening, there's no point in broadcasting. So the vehicle is important. Um, so for instance, video is excellent. Love it. Do videos. Rubbish of complex subjects. Absolute. Don't use video for complex subjects. People don't have the attention span. Again, nervously knowing that Stephen Church is now listening. Text, written word, right? Rubbish. Absolute rubbish. We are, English is a nightmare language. We've got about 10 words for everything. We should all use a Polynesian language, like in Hawaii, where I think they have 16 letters in the alphabet because they don't like the difficult ones. You know, you don't need a Z and an S. It's complex and it's difficult and it's got grammar Then I've already got a spelling mistake in here that somebody's picked up on. You know, it, it's not. But, you know that complex message that video couldn't transmit? Well, text can. So if it's a complex message, good old text. Yay for written word. You know, podcasting. Podcasts are marvellous. As long as somebody's got a set of headphones on, on a train or in somewhere, you know, or whatever. But no good. A podcast is no good in the evening in a family room where six other things are going on because nobody can concentrate. But a bit of written text, you can sit and read that there. See, you see what I'm saying about the, the vehicle is important. And this is why we all misinterpret. Don't have any pretension about it. I'm as bad as it as everybody else. Um, it's all um, uh, about how we see things. We have our own agenda, you know. And if you want proof of that, have a look at people complaining about news coverage on the BBC. Depending on your, their, they are a right wing or a left wing uh, in, in their personal agenda, they complain that the BBC is both. Right? In actual fact, what he's done is reported impartially and nobody liked it. So the right wing have gone, oh, it's lefty agenda. And the left wing have gone, well, it's the right wing agenda. You know, happens all the time. We don't pay attention. We're terrible receivers of information of the, of the things we see and hear. With the exception, obviously, of right now, because I can see how attentive you're all being. Right? Yeah. Everybody paying attention? Bright people? Absolutely. Yes, yes, yes sir. Yeah. Okay. In that case, what was written in the Red Triangle? What, way back when? Yeah. I know. Anybody? You can unmute yourselves if you want to tell him, if you remember the Red Triangle. Remember the... the oh, I was going to do that. I hate when people do that. Do you remember the mistake slide that appeared earlier? Anne-Marie, if you unmute yourself, do you know what was in the Hi. triangle? You know what, Paul, I was going to say I didn't see a red triangle and that would really be very insulting. No, I didn't see a red triangle either. <laughs> Don't ever get in a car with those two ladies. <laughs> it's a bit like the gorilla ex video. Yeah, uh, it, said, it said Paris in the spring. Paris in the spring, okay. Yeah, that's actually, actually, it didn't say that, but uh, it said Paris in the, the spring. Sorry, Paul, say again. It said Paris in the, the spring. Did it? Okay. Nobody? Nobody brave enough. All right, Paul was actually reasonably close. What he's done is he's jumped ahead um, to something that was put in there specifically to draw attention to it. Um, I drew attention to it. It actually said, I love Paris in the, the springtime. 
You all saw it. I pointed it out to you. It came up on screen in a big red triangle, bigger than that in its first instance. And yet now, 15 minutes later, with the exception of Paul, who got the quote wrong, bizarrely, but the mistake right, um, <laughs> we couldn't remember it. You see the problem you're facing when you send your messages out? Human beings were rubbish. Yeah. So that's the reason why you need to tell the story. That there is the reason why I think, because unless, unless, sorry, Sophie, <laughs> but unless you are hitting the mark, unless you're giving people something to hang on to, something to remember, yeah, and your message is clear, of course, because what actually the reason you didn't remember that, it wasn't up very long, and I, I said I drew attention to it. I did, but by distracting you, by turning the attention on me and saying it was my fault and some old backstory, Bullshit, and I made up about it being from a lecture. I've never done this lecture in my life before. Um, that I set up at the beginning, we just trust and we go because human beings love these patterns. Any questions? Okay, let's take you off sharing so you can see everybody there. They all are. Oh, hey, now's the time to wake up because now you can see all of you. I can see you all now. <laughs> Stop, Stop doing that. So does anybody, anybody have any questions for uh, uh, Kevin while he's here live on anything marketing related? Or you, you could ask him a random question on sport, but that probably wouldn't really help. Anyone? You can unmute yourselves and ask the question. Mark, I'm not sure whether your lips are moving or you're trying to say something. You're on mute at the moment. Okay. Yeah, I just want to remark on his cleverness in the distraction technique. That was really smart. It's almost as if I did it for a living, isn't it? <laughs> don't, call, don't call him clever, please. Listen, you know, the point of that, um, Heather, is that it, it, it does just show how easy it is to distract people and how yeah, to, yeah, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's a bit of verbal sleight of hand and a bit of visual sleight of hand, and it, it's simple and easy. But it, it, if he can be distracted that easily by an idiot like me, can you imagine how good people are at it, you know, at getting you to do the opposite? Um, it's marvelous. There's a great story about this, uh, about sleight of hand about sort of changing the way that people perceive the world um a guy called adam ferrier um uh, once was once given the task of selling um salt that is used in swimming pools um and the problem was that the, the product was so boring that nobody wanted it um i'll come back to that in a second mark yes and no um, the, um, and what he did was that to sell the salt, they took it out of a plane bag, put it in a smaller bag, charged more for it and called it princess salt. <laughs> right. And it's now the biggest selling salt brand in Australia. It's exactly the same product inside. Mm. So yeah, Heather, it's easy, isn't it? You know, and we all, we all human beings, wonderful, fantastic actual idiots that we are all trot along and pay extra for salt because of it, you know? And we all do it. We all do it. It's just the way the world is, just the way we work. Mark, how dare you challenge video, young man? <laughs> Tough crowd, Kevin. There's always, there's crowd. always one. Always one, mate. It's no, it's you, Mark. Um, uh, Mark said um, in, in the chat, was uh, I see everybody can see it, you know, is it all it's made out to be Emperor's New Clothes? Yes, on both counts. Video is, is not going to sell products on its own. It's not going to make you a star. You're not going to get it. It's just part of your marketing. There's too much emphasis on it right now. Too much emphasis. <laughs> um, and if you want proof of that, you know, Paul's heard me rant about this before. I think probably um, Shannon, I think you might have heard me ranting about this as well at one point in the past. Look, you scroll down your LinkedIn to your, uh, profile. Look at all that static on there. Just person after person after person appearing on video because that's what you've got to do. Telling me something I knew already in a pretty dull way. You know? Why? Why are you doing that? What are you telling people? And I appreciate, I know that marketing is about consistency. Of course it is. And I know it's a lot all about, you know, appearing there and doing the, the, the thing. And I know it's good for SEO and all that other stuff that goes with it. Um, and, you, you know, it's the same with blogs as well. Blogging for the sake of it is just putting words up. What you're looking for is something that, that, that has people looking at it, you know, that has entertainment value, that has engagement, that has story. If you can hit that, then you, you, yeah, 
video is the answer to everything, Mark, but it's got to be doing that first. It's like anything else. And I, I, I'm going to ask Charles here whether he agrees with me. Charles, every picture you take, is it any good? Or is always. It just, always, mate. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but there's that one, isn't there, every time? Yeah. You know? You can take a thousand photos to get one good one. Yeah. Every bit of marketing is the same. Some of it you just got to do because it's there, but it's the good one that matters, you know, and, it's, and, it, and, it, and you'll get more of those hits if you're thinking about story and you're thinking about those words and you're thinking about your brand promise and thinking about what it is that you're saying to people all the time. So in answer to your question, Mark, yes, no, bugger off, stop mothering me. <laughs> I don't come to your house and hassle you. <laughs> I'm just curious. Would you would you like me to get would you like me to get Mark Exy on a webinar so you can come and get your own back? Kevin? I'm going, yes, yeah. You watch okay. me not wearing trousers. Okay, I'll work on it. I'll work on it. <laughs> well, um, no, that is a good question, Mark. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, the thing that that you touched on earlier in terms of you know where the brand comes from. I know you said it was a simple view and it was a combination of the owner and the business. Yeah. So obviously, in my journey, we, we involved the customers quite a bit, didn't we? Yeah. So that that was quite a valuable thing to do for a rebrand. Obviously, I appreciate if you're starting off and it's a new brand, you can't necessarily do that. But well, maybe not to the same extent. But certainly, if you're setting off a new brand or a new product, you should certainly, I think, be doing that. What we used to call a pen portrait is now called an avatar. Yeah. Not doing that. I hate that. Mm -hmm. But um, but you know that avatar thing where you, you profile who your customers are. Yeah. And, and going asking them what they think of the product, yeah. But yes, you're right, yeah, go on, sorry. No, just, just that, I, I think it's a useful exercise, you know, if any of the things that you suggested you did say you're stuck on, because you don't always know what the three words are, or your fire words, or anything like that, then go and ask your customers, you know, why did they buy you, what, 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 did, they, what did they invest in? And, and very few of them will say price. If they do, then you know the ones to avoid the future. Most, most, most of your clients haven't bought you on price, They've bought you for you know the value you give, but my experience is certainly for smaller businesses. Well, no, bigger businesses. Well, they don't often know what that fire word is or what why the customer has bought from them. They just don't understand necessarily uh, the the words particularly or the journey or anything like that. So it's certainly worth if you've got a client base and you're looking at reviewing your brand, rebranding. Go and ask them. Ask them those yeah. questions. You know, what are the three words? Why did you buy from us? You know, what are, what are the interest? Sorry, Paul, go on. Can I, can I ask a, a question? Yes, please? yes. Right, me, me? Yes, I, yes. I was wondering, um, how, thank you very much. It's been really interesting, really interesting. Thank you. Nice to see you. How, yeah, thank you. How, how would you define brand? I know this is real marketing 101 stuff, but. No, it's not. It's not one on one. I, I, if any, if you ever speak to a marketing person who says brand is, you know, it's dead easy to define, throw them out the door. No, it isn't. <laughs> and if you then follow it up with, and I can guarantee sales, punch them on the way out as well because they're just making that stuff up. Nobody can. You know, there's an old saying about marketing that fifty percent of it works. You just don't know which fifty percent. Um, the, 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 the thing about brand, the brand is 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 an ever expanding thing. It's kind of like. Um, it's like trying to knit with fog at the minute because it keeps changing, Elizabeth. But at the core of it are those values, yeah? yeah. And you could look at a brand and say it's the, the bits you can see, it's the logo or it's the, you know, it's it's the colours you use or whatever. I, and I don't think on their own that is a big enough answer. I think there's more to the brand. I think the brand is these days very much uh, you as well. You know, you yeah. are your brand and you just... Was, was not in there she's clearly kind of on board with that I, uh, you are your brand your business overall is a brand but i think if you if you can find those three words and make sure that filters up into everything and, and, and the brand now is it used to be nice and linear you know the world used to be you walked in a shop somebody told you about a product and you bought it and left you know the world now is this kind of big pulsing ball of constant stuff and blogs and 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 and, and you know graphics web pages and videos and audio files and, and podcasting and, and you know and all this stuff it, it's almost it, as if it's just static around the, the middle bit which is who are you what do you do and why do you do it you know and right. I, I, I call it Simon Sinek there almost but I didn't mean to but but he's right you know uh, the why the it, it's about the, the why of you doing it 
as much as the what and the how you do it. You know what I mean? And your brand is, is the core thing, your values, who you are. You know what I should have done, Kevin? I should have compiled a book and had one of the articles in there about what branding is. You should have done. You should have. If only I'd done that. Who did? Who wrote that one? <laughs> um, uh, that was, uh, I'm just trying to think who did what. It was either Mark, I think it was Mark Oscar, <laughs> um, uh, Oscar. but Marie Louise touched on it in her article as well. Because uh, obviously, you know, it's, it's, it's the sort of... I, do, do you have the book, Elizabeth, the, the bus combo? Oh. I don't know. Shall I send a one? Yeah. Oh, okay. Paul, thank yeah. you. It's, that, thank that was put together by, um, I, you know, I, I, I'm not in it, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I just mentioned that. <laughs> I'm, he's I'm, not bitter, don't worry, he's not bitter. I wasn't good enough to be in there. We, we scoured all over the country to find the experts in their field. <laughs> And you, then, got, you, got, you got somebody to write 2,000 words on how to tie your shoelaces and I still wasn't good enough to win that. <laughs> I'll include you in my book, Kevin, it's fine. Thanks, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, that book, seriously, I can't, I can't see enough. I, I got it back, I was like, um, I, I was semi-involved in it a lot as it went along. And I got it back and I saw it for the first time and I went through and I thought, this is a manual for a successful business. Um, okay. Get hold of that book. It, it, it explains branding in, in, a, in a very clear way. But it really is useful. Paul Green being useful for once. Get the book and frame it. <laughs> <laughs> and then how do you read it when it's framed? Good. That's a good question. So he, he, hadn't, he hadn't thought that far ahead. <laughs> I don't think. I mean, marketing, once it's left the door, I don't care anymore. <laughs> anyway, any, any other questions for uh, Kevin while he's here and available? Uh, Paul, I've got one. If I can quickly just yeah, ask, yeah, Pastor, no, I, no, I know. No. Thank you. Apologies that I'm not on video. I'm I'm really having lockdown here today. Um, so I just wanted to ask him, and you were referring to the avatar or what I would probably refer to as a persona. And mm -hmm. um, I'm in an absolute new startup. How important is it to have your persona defined hey. at this stage, and hey. why? 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 Why so much? Well, I'll tell you for why, I, I, and I believe, I think you can extend this out and go as far as you want with this one. I think it, 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 there's two things um, to think about here. The, the, this idea of avatar and persona, like I said, is fairly new. Paul is probably old enough to remember this as well. We used to call them pen portraits um, for your customers, and you write down who your ideal customer is, what do they look like, what do they do, and, and how do they behave, because what you're trying to do is reach out to them. So, you know, if you, if you haven't done that, if you don't know who your customer is, um, then it's very hard to target any marketing guy to do anything else. And, and there's another thing that started, people are, uh, are doing a lot more now is they're kind of creating one almost for their own brand. You know, mm -hmm. there, is, there is, a, is a rule here that says, um, we, you know, the customer is always right that, that is banded around. And, and uh, well, yeah, the right customer is always right. But if, if you change the wrong ones, it's never going to be a right fit for you or a right fit for them, mm. you know. Mm. Um, I, so I think it's key that you do understand who your customers are and, and who your business is to reach to those customers. Because marketing is about bridges. It's about introducing the right product to the people who want to buy it. It doesn't sell anything. Marketing's never sold anything in its life. Advertising mm. start and sales people. You know, we just make the, a nice fluffy environment in which people want to buy, don't we? Yeah. And I suppose really what I meant by that question as well is um, because you, I, I do have an idea of what my ideal customer, who my ideal customer is, but yeah. is it important to actually document it? That's, that's probably what I was, where I was going with this. Oh, um, I think that's probably a little bit of a, of a thing down to you. I mean, I, I for example, um, I don't have, uh, and I don't know many people who actually do write that down in that sense um but the ones who do find it very useful as a jumping off point i think it's it's the the the, the purpose of writing it down of creating that profile um is it gives you a base point to go back to does it's like your business plan you know you, people write a business plan it's very rare that anybody six months in is actually on the business plan exactly as they wrote it down but what it did was it plotted out where they should be going Mm. Uh, unless it's one of Paul's business plans, of course, because he's an expert. But, um, 
I mean, I, I think it target market, whatever you want to call it, persona, avatar, that word that I've never heard of, Kevin, don't bring me into your world ever again. Um, <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's the mistake that most people make, not just when they're networking, but in all their marketing material, while they're trying yeah. to do all things to all people. And, and the, fit, the reason people do it is the fear of missing out, which I think is a, uh, is it FOMO now, which is very popular. FOMO. FOMO. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, and because you think if you're going to narrow it down to a subset of people, let's, let's pick on a website designer, no website designers here can't offend anybody. So a web site designer can, can physically build a website for anybody. That is a fact. Uh, and I'm sure you the nature of your business is such that you could probably supply your services to anybody. However, when you're marketing or when you're doing your introductions at networking meetings, nobody thinks of anybody at all. And I have numerous examples, uh, just to focus on the networking, but it applies to all your marketing, where people have, uh, big networking, have been networking in the same group, all of a sudden they, they, they focus on a target market and they get referrals from the same people they've been networking with for three, four, six months. Because people think specifically, they think of specific things to refer people. So if you're a website designer, go and build websites for pubs, clubs and restaurants, for example. Because what will happen, someone will come up to you and say, well, actually, I know a hairdresser that wants a website. Will you do that? And then you've got the choice. So it, by narrowing it down to a target, you st if you imagine a, a, a um, what's the word I'm looking for? Arrow shooter, a target, you know, the, 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 the bullseye, then yes, you ideally want your ideal target market to be the bullseye, but if you get a few arrows in the surrounding circles, you're still going to take them, aren't you? So, you know, I, I'll harp on about it. Jackie Sherman, if you ever come across her, I'll harp on about it. Jessica Shales is doing a, a workshop later this month on how to, she calls it persona, on how to define your persona. And you may have different personas for different markets that you address. So it doesn't mean that you just necessarily have to put all your eggs in one basket. Um, you know, you may have two or three different target markets that are different but in 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 speaking to them through marketing you will speak to them in a different way um and that that's the thing to be conscious of so um, absolutely, absolutely. And the other thing to add to that paul just before i forget is niche sells you know niche marketplaces sell um i'm looking at the people who are on and i'm thinking you know charles you're the obvious example of niche selling shannon you, know, you you have a market but we always say it as an it's oh well, it's a niche market as if it's a throwaway no it's not if you if you're in the niche market if you've got that hold on a on a you know a group of invested buyers because you know their personalities you know who they are you've done your avatar work mm -hmm. then, wow you know that's not the holy grail isn't it you just got repeat sales oh incoming from mark kevin no, I incoming, mark. are you waving goodbye no. i think no no i'm not um i think i think the one of the biggest issues that i've based is that we do have clients from lots of different sectors yeah and we started off with the sectors that we knew because that's where we worked in corporate and that, that was obviously the easiest place to start and then yeah. it becomes yeah. massive and it becomes a lot about people and who they know so yeah it, you're right you need to I've quite often said that we particularly like manufacturing and um, logistics and engineering because actually we're familiar with that but the reality is that we've got like two farming clients, for example, but it's difficult to actually play on that particularly because they are very different. But at the same time, I think it's about the people involved and who they know. So to me, it's always about yeah. appealing to the people in the room or the people who you already provide a service for and actually them to say to other people who they know in different sectors, ah, oh, they're good guys. Why don't you try give them a try? And we actually ask them for that. You know, it's asking for referrals, which a lot of people do find difficult. But I think it's it's a no win. You know, it's a nothing to lose scenario. They can always say no or, or I don't really know anybody. But it's amazing how many people go, actually, yeah, I do know some you could probably use your services. <laughs> it's, match, it's matching, making sure that you're matching to your, your business as well, isn't it, Mark? Because, mm -hmm. you know, if... Um, we look at the, the again some of the, the the businesses that are on here. There is absolutely no point in in marketing to the wrong people. Why bother? You know what I mean. So, um, you, you know, uh, from your point of view, there's no point in you going off uh, a very little business in one man operations. Why market to? Them? So that that avatar process that you do, you know, that knowing your customer process targets your your focus anyway, doesn't it? And, and for you, Mark, uh, it might not need a sector. 
you know, it might be certain HR companies are looking for companies with 20 staff that are growing or have high absentee. You know, it's a different way of defining your target yeah. market. It might not narrow you down necessarily to a sector. But yeah, the, the, the more specific you can be. I know someone's doing a Facebook thing at the moment in one of the groups. We're asking people to actually say who their ideal client is. Uh, and they're doing it in a way of which was all right for one. It's getting a bit tedious now. I hope they're not listening or listening to the playback. But it, but it's like you know, old, old Pam is thirty six years old. She lives in Northampton. You know, and that that's one way of doing it. But then when everybody does that, that's not a good way of getting your message uh, uh, across. But taking the elements of that, you know, age, sex, location, industry sector, if it's relevant. You know, there's lots of different criteria which you can look at to mm -hmm. sort of uh, hone it down. And I don't know if that helped Anne Marie or whether she's nodded off or we waffled on about okay. No, no, no. I'm I'm absolutely listening. <laughs> Good, because there's a quiz at the end, Anne Marie. So I hope you listen. <laughs> it's about red uh, triangles mainly. So uh, yeah. So I'm conscious of time. Um, uh, we normally sort of only allow an hour for this, so you're welcome to duck out if you need to go. Does anybody have anything else for Kevin while you're here? If you do, obviously, as a if you're a Buscom member, you've got the 20 minutes, then you can call them the polls if you need to, and all that sort of stuff. The, the, I can't remember what you called it now. What I call you? No, not me. I know what you call me. Oh, okay. Sorry, I got confused. Mentor. Yeah, it's uh, it's ask the experts. So yeah. you've got 20 minute consultation slots with various experts in their field. Yeah, and people should make more use of those. I think. Yeah, yeah can challenge. I just jump in um i had one of those calls with kevin a few weeks ago and like this um webinar it was really helpful so yeah i'd recommend having a chat with kevin i think that was about video and well, really i wanted to ask about food videos but um yeah this has been really helpful the same as your last one so thank you very much thanks Shannon. really good there you yeah. go I bet, you. Glad, I bet you're glad you picked on her now kevin i am i am <laughs> I expect to just storm off halfway through. <laughs> right, guys, um, if that's it, if there's nothing nothing more, I'll let you good people get on for the rest of your day and no doubt see you online at some point shortly. If you want to stay on sofa and we can arrange a one-to-one. -one. Yep, no worries. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Kevin. Kevin. Thank Have a good day. Bye. Bye. Kevin. Kevin. Bye.